pray. I want to welcome everybody this January 17th in the new year. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we will worship God together in song. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that this is a new year, new challenges, but your mercies are great for us and new every morning. And you are faithful, God. You brought us through difficulties in the past, and you're doing it today, and you'll do it in the future. And Lord, help us to put our faith and trust in you alone to make it through this new year. Encourage us this morning through your word, through your Holy Spirit. May we live for you and not for ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen. The first song we're going to sing today is called Glorious. And um, I like this song. I've done it before. Just imagine seeing God's glory. Uh, only few people have seen his glory in a very close, special way. Moses, of course, comes to mind in the Old Testament. He went up on the mountain. He received the oracles of God, the Ten Commandments, and his face shone brightly because he got that close to God. We know that Jesus was God in human flesh, and the Bible says that we saw him. We handled him with our hands. We touched him. We heard him, and we were close to him, and we weren't destroyed, just like in the Old Testament. No man can see God and live. And um, through Jesus, we can have a relationship with God. But also in our, in our quiet times, when we read God's word, when we pray, God can commune with our spirits because he is spirit. And this song kind of um, talks about that. Why don't we sing that together right now? It's called Glorious. Inside the mystery, see the empty cross, see the risen Savior, victorious and strong. No one else above him, none is strong to say. He alone has conquered the power of the grave, glory.
So just like God is glorious and we can see his glory, maybe not as the apostles did who walked with him and talked with him, but in a very real way, mystically, as we read the Bible and God ministers to us, we can see and feel his glory. The next one I want to sing is called The Goodness of God. And sometimes we forget just how good God has been to us. We are people of the present. We live in the present. We think about what we have to do today, maybe tomorrow. If we really think ahead, maybe a week or two. But sometimes when we live like that, it's easy to forget all the faithful things that God has done for us. All the good things that he has done for us. And we need to reflect on those. There's a song in the past when I was a kid, we would sing it in Sunday school sometimes, but count your blessings, count them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. And sometimes when you don't count your blessings, you're blessed and you don't even realize it. You don't, if you don't realize you're blessed, you don't give thanks back to God. And I fall into that trap sometimes. But this song helps us to remember how good and faithful God is to us. Let's sing this one together. The goodness of God. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. And all my days I've been held in your hand. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, oh, I will sing of the goodness. Of God.
Your mic is mute. Thank you, so, so sorry about that. We're gonna get to the message in just a minute, but first, a few announcements, and I'd like to welcome each and every one of you that made your schedules out to include time with God and with other believers, even if it's just online. And um, I see a number of people, I'm not gonna go through name by name because we are recording, but I just wanna welcome you I'm glad to hear you're here. I'm glad to see your faces, those that you of you who have um, let your videos be shown. And I'm praying for you during these uh, COVID months and times of separation and abnormality. I would like to run through a couple announcements real briefly before we get to our message. And I'll show these on the screen. If you're not a member of our WhatsApp group and would like to send your name and your telephone number to NOCBC Kenner at gmail.com. And we're gonna share prayer requests. You can do so now or anytime during this service using the chat feature on Zoom. At the end of the service, we'll also have a chance to unmute your mics and share prayer requests with each other. Team Kid and prayer meeting are still going on Wednesday nights and or Friday nights and Wednesday nights respectively. The Zoom IDs are on the screen. I did check the prayer meeting one. I know that's right. The Team Kid one, I think it's still right. Giving, as always, in these last month, recent months, we can send our checks to NOCBC. Attention, Julia Chung, 3413 Continental Drive, Kenner, Louisiana, 70065. We've been studying a little bit in Genesis, and we'll be in Genesis today and for the next couple of weeks. And Jacob was one who God met him in a very um, special way in a dream and said, I will be with you. I will bless you and nations will come out of you. And God, Jacob woke up from his dream and said, God is in this place. And he named that place Bethel. And he also said of everything that you've given me, I will give you a tenth. And the principle is there even before Moses, before the Ten Commandments, before all those things, and it's one that we still apply today. It doesn't mean that you're under the law to do this, and God's going to be unpleased, displeased with you if you don't give a tenth of what he gives to you. But it is a principle that everything that we have is from God, and we should be willing to sacrificially give back to God. And today we do that through the church. We give the tithes to the church. God um, receives it in heaven. Let's pray for these right now. God, thank you for the chance to give back to you a portion of what you've given to us. And we ask, as you do uh, many times in the Bible, that you will multiply the gift. I pray that you will bless each and every giver in their spiritual lives and their relationships with you, in their families, in their workplaces, and that you'll make them, draw them closer to you. God, use these tithes and offerings so that the gospel may go out and people will hear, believe your um, gift of salvation, turn from their sins and be saved. May we do our part in our lives and the influence that you've given us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The message today is about wrestling with God. Some people are just in a lifetime struggle. From the moment they're born to the day they die, 
their life could be characterized as struggle. Struggle in uh, relationships, struggle in school or academic, struggle in business or work, just a period or a lifetime of struggle. Jacob's life could also be described as a life of struggle. His struggle was a lifetime of wanting to obtain God's blessing. What is God's blessing? God's um, gifts, God's happiness, uh, God's goodness, his mercy, the struggle to obtain that. And it's no accident that when we read in Genesis of the birth of Jacob and Esau, these were Isaac's and Rebekah's two sons. They were twins. They were born at the same time. But Esau came out first. And when he came out, someone was holding his foot. Jacob was holding Esau's foot. And they both came out together. Esau beat him by just a few seconds. And because Jacob was holding his brother's foot as he came out of the womb, he got this name, Jacob. And in Hebrew, the name actually means supplanter, or it could be named deceiver, someone who is trying to be first uh, because of the way he was born. But that act, how he was born and his name became representative of his life. And so we see in Jacob's life, his um, cunning, his own little plans, his devices, his tricks in order to try to get God's blessing. One of the first tricks that's recorded is this birthright. Now, birthright is a special, um, um, a special kind of blessing from the parents in form of inheritance. So a special kind of inheritance. And this was reserved for the firstborn. But Jacob found a time when Esau, his, first, his older brother, was extremely weary. He had been out. He had been hunting. He apparently was at the point of death or close to it, and he came in and Jacob had probably prepared, knowing that he was going to be so tired, and he had prepared this wonderful meal, and uh, this meal of stew, and Esau came and said, give me some of that stew, I'm about to die, I'm so hungry, and Jacob said, I'll give you the stew if you sell me your birthright. You give me your birthright, your special inheritance that you should have as the firstborn, and I'll give you some stew. And Esau said, what good is my birthright if I'm dead? And so, sure, I agree. And so Jacob gave him his stew. Esau gave Jacob the birthright. It wasn't the way it was supposed to happen. It was supposed to be Esau's. But Esau despised the birthright and gave it up. Esau knew that the most important thing was the blessing. When the father prays to the God of um, Abraham and Isaac, if he prays to him and he calls down a blessing on you, then you'll be blessed and God's going to make you increase. That is also reserved for the oldest son. And so Esau said, oh, forget the birthright. I'll go for the blessing. But lo and behold, when it time came, Isaac, their father, was getting older and Jacob uh, through his mother said, hey, you need to trick your father. He's old. He can't see. He can't. He's not really all there. You can trick him. Isaac sent out Esau to bake the stew, the special food that he likes. And while Esau was gone, I, uh, Jacob's mother helped him prepare the stew that's similar to Esau's and then to wear some skin some animal skins to make his arms hairy because Esau was hairy, but he was not hairy and uh, to smell like Esau. And so he went in and uh, Jacob, I mean, Isaac said, who is it? And Jacob said, it's Esau. He lied. And Isaac was a little bit nervous. He said, the voice is the voice of Jacob, but the feeling him is the feeling of Esau because he had those skins on and Isaac blessed Jacob. And the Bible says no sooner had Jacob left than Esau came in with his stew and said, and Isaac trembled and said, who is it? And Esau said, it's Esau, your firstborn. And Isaac said, no, it couldn't be. 
I've already blessed someone. It was Jacob, your younger brother. And Esau said, don't you have a blessing for me? For me too, your firstborn. And Isaac said, I've blessed your younger brother and he will be blessed. But I do have something, a blessing for you. But when he gave his blessing, he said, you're going to serve your younger brother. And, um, and so on. Jacob was a man who lived up to his name of trying to be first, of supplanting someone else. And he went off. He had to flee from his older brother, Esau, and he went off all by himself. That's when God appeared to him and said, I'll be with you, even though you're imperfect. You um, are uh, cunning, but you seek after me and you seek after my blessing and I will bless you in spite of all your imperfections. And in fact, God is the same way with us. In spite of all of our imperfections, our sin, he still seeks after us and wants a relationship with us. Jacob went to uh, um, his uncle's house and he found a wife there. He actually found two wives there, although he only wanted one. Rachel was the one he loved. And Laban, we think of Jacob as being this uh, tricky little guy. Laban was twice as tricky. His uncle knew even more about tricking others than he did. And Lab uh, Jacob worked seven years. And it says the seven years were as a day in Jacob's sight because he loved his uncle's daughter, Rachel, who must have been stunningly beautiful. And the night came for him to be married. And of course, they're drinking wine and not really knowing what's going on. And the Bible says, in the morning after he married, and in the morning, behold, it was Leah. It wasn't even Rachel. It was her older, older sister, Leah. And Jacob says, what? Laban, you tricked me. And Laban says, oh, it's not our custom to give the younger daughter first. Uh, work another seven years, and I'll give you Rachel. Um, apparently, he gave Rachel pretty soon. Jacob went ahead and worked the seven years, even though he got Rachel. And God gave Jacob sons and daughters through both Leah and Rachel and also through their handmaidens. Occasionally, Leah or Rachel would, could not get pregnant. And so they said, I still want more children. Well, I'll have children through my servant maid, my handmaid. And Jacob had kid um, sons through them too. Anyway, God blessed Jacob tremendously there with sons, with daughters, with lots of flocks, wealth, was accumulating, and eventually he said, what? I'm getting too big. But God appeared to him in chapter 31, verses 3. He also appeared to him again in verses uh, 10 through 13 and said, return to your land of Canaan. Return to your home uh, country. And so he's going to do that. On that way, uh, there's a thing with Laban and all, um, he eventually um, leaves from Laban because God meets Laban and says, don't you touch Jacob. He's mine. And if you do so, you do it at your own risk. And Laban was terrified. He didn't mess with Jacob at all or his family, his grandkids. And um, Jacob goes on. But Esau, he hears, is coming for him. His older brother is coming for him with 400 armed men. That put fear into Jacob's heart. And it's at this point that we're going to bring read the text. He cries out to God. He prays to God. And he says, I'm not worthy of anything, the kindness, the goodness that you've shown to me, but I have a big problem. Esau's coming with 400 armed men, and he's coming to destroy me because I tricked him two different times, and he hates me. You promised me that, you, um, that I should come back to the land of Canaan, and you would take care of me and bless me. Now I'm at your mercy. Basically, he had that prayer. And then he devises his own plans. Um, let's send Esau all these presents. Let's uh, send them flocks and gifts and all these things. Maybe I can appease my brother Esau. And then we come to this time. Everything had left. He had sent everything over the, um, over the Jabuk River. And he's left all alone. And we're going to come to this text. I'm going to share the screen and read it read it to you. But the title of the message is Wrestling with God. At some point, we're going to come to a, 
a time when we're alone, when we need God in a special way. And what are we going to do in that instance? Are we going to turn to our own devices or are we going to um, hold on fast to God? Genesis 32, verses 22 through 30. That night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his 11 sons and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip, so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, it is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. Let's pray. God, I pray that through your word, you will speak to us in a personal way. In Jesus' name, amen. Three things I want to talk about from this text this morning. One, acknowledge our need. When we're in that time of great need, we need to acknowledge it to God. Two, come clean. Don't pretend that you're better than you really are. Three, persist in your relationship with God, in prayer to him, in obedience to him. Acknowledge need, come clean, and persist. First, acknowledge our need. We need to do this through solitude and prayer. We already saw several times in Genesis, and I mentioned it in the intro, that Jacob was alone with God. God met with him. He communed with God several times in Genesis. We see this. He's praying to God, and God is communicating with, to him. And especially in this last chapter, in this text that we read, Jacob was left alone. Jesus talked a lot about prayer. And often, what did he say? Don't go out in public. If, if your only prayers are those in public or in front of people at church or in your Bible study group, it's not the same as being alone with God when no one else can hear. And God who sees you in secret will reward you. Jesus, it said, would go up on a mountainside or go up into a solitary place and pray early in the morning, sometimes late at night, and all through the night he would do that. If Jesus, who was God's own son, set an example like that, how much more do we who are human beings, errant in our thoughts and our actions and our motives, how much more do we need to rely on God in solitude and in prayer? Not only that, but we need to uh, secondly, be humble. Genesis 32, 10, it's the section of text right before Jacob wrestling. He's praying out to God. He's admitting his um, unworthiness. He said in Genesis 32, 10, I am unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness you have shown your servant. The book of James also says what? Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. God shows himself pretty stern with those who are unwilling to admit their sin. For those who pretend to be better than they really are, God comes close to those who admit their sin and in humility come to him. Often, I mean, in the book of Luke, we read about the tax collector and the Pharisee at the temple. The Pharisee said, oh, God, I thank you that I'm not as other people like uh, adulterers or 
um, th thieves or stealers, or even as that tax collector right there. I tithe twice in the week. We as Christians tithe what, once in a week? I tithe twice in the week. I, I mean, I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of everything. He was so proud of himself. But at the end of that, the tax collector beat his breast and said, God have mercy on me, a sinner. And at the end, there's a little verse there that says, who do you think went home um, justified before God? The Pharisee or the tax collector? And the answer is the tax collector went home justified before God because he was humble. Jacob demonstrated humility in his life. Also commitment. Now God uh, met Jacob in 30, chapter 31, verse 3. He said, return to the land of Canaan. Okay. Again, a few verses later, he appears to him again and says, return to the land of Canaan. Now, what if Jacob did not return? If he just stayed in that place? Well, commitment to God means that you actually act on his word. He says, do something and you do it. He was all in. All his possessions, all his people, he picked up and he moved. Maybe God at some point in your life is going to ask you to do something big. Maybe you've come to America, if you're Chinese or if you're from another country, and you've gotten a job and God's blessed you. He's given you material things. He's given you a house, car, children, whatever. But he may call you at some time to go back, just like he called Jacob to go back after he had blessed him immensely. And you'll have to struggle with that decision. Am I going to do what God said or am I not? And Jacob decided to do what God said and to go back. We acknowledge our need through prayer and humility and commitment. But second, we need to come clean. And the first part of coming clean is confessing. Now, often we think of confession as confession of sin. And there is, um, obviously, we need to confess sin, but there's also other things that we need to confess. For example, Jacob, in the prayer I was just saying, he was confessing to God, I, all that I have is from you. The um, children you've given me are from you. The great um, abundance of possessions that you've given me are from you. He said, when I left Canaan and came to this place, all I had was the staff in my hand. That was it. And the clothes on my body. And when I left, you've given me all these great things. Acknowledge that. Confess that to God. All I have is from you. But then he said, I have a big problem. Esau is coming with 400 armed men, and he means to do me harm. Confess your need to God, the things that are troubling you in your physical life. And also, Remember God's promises when you confess to God. Jacob called out. This is 32, chapter 32, verses 10, 11, and 12. He called out and he said, God, but you promised me that you were going to take care of me and bless me. Claim that promise, just like Jacob did. God is the one that um, called you. He's the one that blessed you. He's the one that promises that he's going to be with you. Claim that promise before God, just like Jacob did. But also, we need to repent, not just confess our um, situation, our need, our problem, but we also need to repent. The great thing about this is that God doesn't call you to become perfect immediately. He reveals things in our lives step by step. Um, we may have a, a dirty mouth and uh, we don't even realize it. Why everyone at school or work talks with profanity. Um, sometimes we see it on movies and that sort of thing. But little by little, he may start convicting you that some of the words you're using are not appropriate. Some of the movies you're watching are inappropriate. The music listening to, inappropriate. And he does this little by little. It's as the Holy Spirit comes in and convicts. Now, we have to make a decision. Do we change? Or do we keep going? And as we change, God gives us more light, more of himself, more of his Holy Spirit, and we come closer to him. Interestingly, in the book of Genesis, even at this time that God is blessing Jacob, 
people are idol worshipers. They've got idols. They've got images. They've got things that they shouldn't rely on. Why? Because a few chapters later in Genesis 35, Jacob says, we need to give up all the idols. And so people are pulling out idols. We already know Rachel stole some idols from her dad, Laban, but she still got them at this point where God's going to deliver him from Esau. And they've got other objects and they bury those and then they move on. Now, that's the thing. If you look in chapter 35, a few chapters later, we're in chapter 32 right now, um, right at the beginning, verses two through five, they acknowledge they've got the, these idols, these things in their lives that they shouldn't have. They're taking away from their dependence on God. They bury those things and then they move on. Verse 35, five is important because after we confess sin, after uh, we get right with God, we need to move on. We've confessed our problem with this person or with uh, um, this uh, lust or with this greed or with this pride, 30, Genesis 35, 5, and they moved on. They set out. We need to do the same thing when we come clean before God. So Jacob does this as he's, um, before he wrestles, he moves on, he confesses, he repents, he moves on. Third we need to persist. And the first thing about persisting is clinging to God. We have the um, passage that we just spoke of. Um, Jacob is there. He's all alone and he's persistent. Jesus also talked about um, being persistent. He used a, a parable. He said, uh, how many of you parents out there, if your son comes and says, I'm hungry, give me some bread. You'll give him a rock. Chew on this. Uh, no. How many if, of you, if your children come to you and say, I need something, you'll give them a snake and say, here, catch this. Play with that for a while. Well, that's not like a GI Joe or a um, remote control car or something. No, that's dangerous. And then Jesus said this statement, if you who are not perfect, who are evil, give good things to your kids. How much more will God in heaven give good things to you when you ask him? All we need to do is persist. What does Jacob do? He says, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Jacob's whole life was concerned with getting blessing from God. And right now he's wrestling with this man. Now, is it a man? Is it an angel? Is it God? Well, the indication is, is that he's wrestling with a form of God himself. I think since God is spirit, that it's not God the Father, but, also, but actually God the Son, before he was born and became Jesus in flesh, he was still around in the Old Testament. Um, and we see different times when we think God or Jesus before he was born takes on a form and appears to people. And I think that's what happened here. Why? Because Jacob said, I've seen God face to face and I wasn't destroyed. So he's wrestling and he's clinging and he's saying, I won't let you go unless you bless me. If we are persistent in our relationship with God, we need to have that same kind of tenacity when we pray, God, I won't let you go unless you bless me. I'm not just going to keep on living my life without you. I need you more than everything. It's an acknowledgement that without him, we can do nothing. Secondly, we cling to him. We also own up. There's no false so. We need to admit our weaknesses, who we really are. Now, this is the interesting thing in this passage. Why does this man, this man from God, ask him his name. What's your name? It's because his name, his very name, spoke to who he was his whole life. What's your name? It was like a dagger going straight into the heart of Jacob. Why? Because he knew his name was not a glorious name. His name meant supplanter, deceiver, um, wanting to be first. 
That's your name. That's who you are. That's described your whole life, Jacob. That's why he asked us his name, I think. And then the man says, your name will no longer be deceiver, supplanter. Your name will be Israel, prince with God. Now, it sounds very similar to one who wrestles with God, but a little um, consonant is changed in that name to make it prince with God. God, when we cling to him, he changes our identity, just like he changed Jacob's identity. We become sons, his sons, his daughters. We're adopted into his family. And we have an identity to live up to. We're all made in the image of God, but we don't live up to that image. And um, Jacob needs to live up to this new image after um, clinging to God. And God will do it. Um, not only do we own up to who we are, God gives us an identity. We need to seek more of God. Interestingly, in this passage, Jacob says, what's your name? And the man doesn't tell him his name. And we think, why? He's clinging with, to you. He's um, confessed. He's open. He's honest about who he is. But this man won't share his name. And later in Exodus, we find out Moses is at the burning bush. And Moses says, who am I to tell sent me if they ask me who sent you? And that's the first time God tells mankind his personal name, which is I am or Yahweh. I am that I am. And in Genesis 6, he says, to Abraham, to Isaac, and Jacob, I appeared to them as God Almighty, but I never appeared to them as my personal name. I am that I am. Now I am. And it's, it, it represents a, a change in the way God is relating to his people, Israel, and the way God relates to us. Be that as it may, Jacob wanted to seek more of God. He wanted God's personal name. Even though he didn't get it, he wanted it. How much of God do we want? Are we satisfied with just a verse here or there, a message on Sunday morning, maybe a, a YouTube video on uh, um, the Bible or about God? Or do we want God in a deep, personal, um, intense way? like Jacob did. Pray to God that he will meet to you in that intense personal way. There's a story of uh, Mr. Rogers. Now, there's a movie that came out recently about Mr. Rogers. He was a Christian man, and he went to meet with a boy that had a teenager who had cerebral palsy. Those with cerebral palsy, they can't speak very well it's a lot of times, depending on the severity of it. This teenage boy could only communicate by typing it on a, um, either a, type, a keyboard or a computer screen. And he went in there and the boy um, couldn't handle it. His mom had to take him to another room. But Mr. Rogers was patient. And eventually the boy came back and he, Mr. Rogers, asked the boy, I want you to do something for me. And I wonder if you can do it. And Mr. Rogers asked the boy, would you pray for me? And the boy was um, really astonished that Mr. Rogers would ask him to pray for him. No one had ever asked him to pray for them. Usually, other people are praying for this boy with cerebral palsy. And the boy said, okay, I agree. I'll pray for you. And every day, he began to pray for Mr. Rogers. Now, later, someone was interviewing Mr. Rogers how did you know that that's exactly what this boy needed? Um, someone to ask him to pray for, for, um, for you. And Mr. Rogers said, you don't understand. I didn't ask the boy to pray for me because that would help him. I asked the boy to pray for him because I need his intercessions. And the interviewer said, I don't understand. What do you mean? And the boy said, and Mr. Rogers said, I think, Anyone who has gone through such difficulty as that boy must be close to God. And I want someone who's close to God to pray for me. That was his answer. 
I asked him because I wanted his intercession. When we're facing difficulties, when we're facing um, times in our lives where we feel not close to God, remember Jacob. Remember clinging to God, not letting God go until he blesses us, gives us an answer with such intensity as that. God will draw close to us. The promise is draw close to God and he will draw close to you. Let's pray and then we'll sing our final song together. Oh God, let us not be lackadaisical about our walk with you, but treat you as our precious jewel that we'll go and sell everything in order to have our relationship close with you. We'll give up anything in order to be close with you because you are worth it. You are our God. Without you, we have nothing and we can do nothing of eternal significance. God, I pray that you'll meet with us today and this week as we seek to be closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Our last song as we sing together is about different stages of life and um, being committed to God, even when our souls are not very uh, uh, calm. God can give us uh, the strength that we need. This song is called Be Still, My Soul. Let's sing it together. Be still, my soul, the Lord is on your side. Bear patiently the cross of grief or pain. Leave to your God to order and provide. In every change, He Oh, safe.